Good afternoon, all. I think it's about time we start. Uh, just one more, uh, one more minute left. So in the meantime, uh, uh, let me uh, say a few few things. Uh, welcome you all uh, to the first uh, session on the instrumentation and uh, techniques. As you might have seen, there are five talks in this session. The first one is an invited uh, talk of uh, duration 30 minutes. Uh, rest of the talk and giving some time for question and answers. And I'm not sure we'll be able to take all the questions though. Um, I would uh, strongly recommend you to put the questions uh, in the Slack channel also and request uh, the presenters uh, to respond to those uh, questions. And uh, I uh, most of the most of you have tested the uh, presentation except uh, Vipin. I'm not sure if he's attending in person or online. Uh, that is the third talk. Uh, no, fourth talk. Uh, so let's see. Hope uh, he will be joining. So now, uh, with this, uh, my, my request Prashant Kumar to present his uh, talk on solar wind ion spectrometer, that is with instrument capability and plenary test and uh, ground calibration. Over to you, Prashant. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I am audible and my slide is visible. Yes. Uh, yes so I am Prashant and I'm and I'm a part of the aspects team here at PRL Ahmedabad. So before I start my talk, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to discuss about the payload which we have been developing for the upcoming Aditya L1 mission. Uh, I'll be mostly covering the instrument details, its capability, and the, some data product definitions for solar wind ion spectrometer, which is a part of the aspects payload being developed by PRL. So this will be the outline of my talk. I'll start with an introduction to the Aditya L1 mission as well as the aspects payload, uh, followed by an overview of the Swiss instrument, which will be the major topic for today's talk. In this, I'll talk about the design simulation as well as the final realized instrument specification. Uh, this will be followed by the calibration plan for at subsystem level, as well as uh, for the complete instrument. I'll be also talking to you about the onboard calibration plan, which we have for this payload, as well as for the cross calibration plan. And I will uh, just show you some preliminary results, which we have obtained for the ground calibration uh, uh, of, the, of the final flight model packages. Uh, finally, I would like to spend some time on the operation as well as uh, the data products, which this particular payload will generate, in which I will talk to you about the various modes in which this payload can operate, as well as the data product definitions. So coming on to the Aditya L1 mission, so as most of you may be aware that it is the uh, ISRO's first mission to, I mean, first mission which will study the sun comprehensively. Uh, the spacecraft will be situated uh, in a halo orbit around the L1 point of the sun earth system, and it is three axis stabilized. And it has a different, so, I mean, it has a suite of payloads. So there are four uh, remote sensing payloads. The first one is a coronagraph, so, which is known as visible emission line coronagraph uh, being developed by IIA. Then we also have a UV imager, uh, which is SUIT, Solar U uh, Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope being developed by IUCA. And then there are two X-ray spectrometers, Solex and Helios, uh, covering different ranges uh, uh, in the X-ray domain uh, being developed by URSC. We also have three in-situ particle, I mean, in-situ uh, measurement payloads. So two are particle spectrometers. Uh, the one which will be uh, discussed in today's talk is aspects. And then we also have a PAPA payload, which is plasma analyzer payload for Aditya, which is being developed by SPL Trivandrum. And also there's a magnetometer, which is also developed by SPL Trivandrum. The space, uh, spacecraft is expected to be launched in uh, late uh, uh, this year, 2022, or probably in early 2023. And the expected mission life is uh, uh, than five years. Now, coming on to the aspects uh, payload, uh, as I've told you before that uh, uh, we are developing this payload uh, with, uh, with some support from SAC Ahmedabad in terms of uh, hardware realization, as well as different uh, space qualification tests. And the major objective of this payload is to carry out in-situ measurement of particle fluxes, uh, uh, starting from 100 eV and going up to almost 20 MeV per nucleon. So a typical solar uh, ion spectrum for oxygen, you can see it from the figure on the right. So it uh, almost starts from almost 10 eV and it goes up to almost 100 MeV kind of thing. 
And uh, the major, uh, I mean, major observable parameters which we will be recording using this spectrometer are the ions which are coming from different energies, so starting from 100 AV and going up to 20 MeV. And we will be doing it in two different planes. So we will be measuring the particles which are coming in the ecliptic plane as well as across it. And there are various, uh, 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 like various measurement uh, uh, requirements which we have. So this particular instrument will measure the solar wind directional as well as energy anisotropies by having a multi-directional capability. It will also have a mass resolved uh, capability to separate out the proton and alpha from the solar wind. So it will give us the ratio of the alpha to proton ratio over a very large energy range. And moreover, by having a multi-directional observation, we'll be able to address some of the acceleration mechanism as well as interplanetary process in the propagation of the solar wind. So uh, now to cover this vast energy range, starting from 100 MeV up to 20 MeV, this, uh, particular, um, this, this particular payload has been configured into two different spectrometers. So we have a low energy ion spectrometer, which covers ion energies up to 20 KV, which we call a solar wind ion spectrometer. And this will be the main topic of discussion today. And for the high energy part, we have uh, strips, which is suprathermal energy typical particle spectrometer, which goes from 20 kV up to 20 MeV. Now, going on to the low energy ion spectrometer, which is solar wind ion spectrometer, uh, it consists of three different packages, which are shown the figure, uh, which is shown in the figure given on the right. So it has two sensor packages, THA1 and THA2. So these THAs are uh, basically uh, uh, cylindric, I mean, hemispherical analyzers. And also, which, I mean, THA1 also has a mass resolving capability. Uh, it uses some 16 semirian cobalt magnet to separate out the masses. And both these analyzers uh, require some high voltage bias to be provided uh, in order to operate. So that is provided to a separate package, which we call as a HV package, which is shown at the base of the tower, tower which is shown on the figure on the right. Now, the, uh, uh, the location of this particular uh, uh, payload on the spacecraft is shown on the figure, uh, is shown in the figure on the left. So the tower is used to mount both these sensor packages, THA1 and THA2, and this is required just to clear the field of view uh, requirement for both these sensor packages. Uh, we'll see some details into uh, both these analyzers. So as I've told you before that these have been configured into two different uh, sub packages, top head analyzer one and top head analyzer two. So top head analyzer uh, one, as you can see from uh, this figure actually uh, sits on the top of the tower. So it will scan the particles which will come in the ecliptic plane and top head analyzer two will come, uh, will scan the particles which will come uh, uh, in the plane perpendicular to the ecliptic. And uh, uh, the cross sectional view of this of, of these top end analyzers can be seen from the figure which is given on the right the bottom. So you can see the various bias, uh, HV bias voltages which we are applying. So uh, we have different kinds of bias voltages starting from minus 2.5 kV for electrostatic analyzer. Then we have a focusing grid assembly. And then we have a magnet. And then we have a micro channel plate detector, which again requires a bias of uh, around minus 2.3 kV. Uh, I've also shown you a, a demonstration of the uh, functioning of this particular uh, instrument. So the simulation shown on the top right figure uh, shows you the typical trajectory an ion will take inside this analyzer. So once it enters the topmost region, which is electrostatic analyzer region, so based on the potential which we apply on the inner plate, a particular energy will be selected. It will be passed on to a focusing grid assembly followed by the magnetic analyzer. And based on the mass, it will be radially deflected inwards. So lighter masses will be deflected more compared to heavier masses. And once we have a position sensitive detector at the base of this package, we can actually identify the mass as well as the direction in which the particle is coming. So for both these THs, we are using micro channel plate detectors as well as a position sensitive anode, which we have developed in house, uh, which is based on the principle of charge division and is known as resistive anode encoder or RE. So this is the final uh, instrument specification. Uh, so we have two sensor units, THA1 and THA2. THA1 will have FOB in the ecliptic plane, uh, and it will also have a mass analyzing capability. THA2 uh, has an FOB in the plane perpendicular to, to the ecliptic. It doesn't have a magnetic mass analyzer, so it will give us an integrated uh, flux of the particle. 
Uh, both these sensor units have an energy range from 100 dB up to 20 kV, and the energy resolution which we are aiming to achieve using both these analyzers is better than 10%. Uh, the geometric factor of the instrument has been selected such that it will cover the entire range from uh, entire range of particles from 100 dB up to 20 kV. And as you can understand from the previous simulation that uh, the FOV for both these instruments is 2 pi in, in each of the instruments azimuthal plane. And it is roughly around 3 degree conical FOV in the elevation plane. Uh, but as I've told you before that we are now, we have, we are using microchannel plate detectors uh, for ion detection along with a position sensitive anode RAE. And in THA1, we are additionally using a magnetic mass separator, which consists of 16 Severian cobalt magnet, so with uh, roughly a remnant magnetic field value of 1.0 Tesla. Now, because we are using MCP detectors, the operating condition becomes slightly tricky. We always need to operate these detectors in vacuum, which is better than 1 minus 6 millibar kind of range. And as far as instrument operation is concerned, for, de for the default scan, uh, in the default integration time, which is roughly around 450 millisecond, it will take around 25 seconds to cover the entire energy range from 100 dB to 20 kV. And we also have a high cadence mode in which it will, uh, in which the, the integration time is uh, around 50 millisecond. So it takes around five seconds for the complete scan. Now, what is, uh, I mean, uh, more specific to this particular instrument is that both the number of steps as well as the energy range in which it scans can be programmed. So advantage of this can be seen in a later slide when I will discuss about the uh, uniqueness of this particular instrument. So, uh, I mean, see, I mean, as at present, we already have three particle spectrometers operating at the L1 point. We have ACE, SWIFAM instrument of the ACE, then we have PSIL on wind spacecraft. And also we, and we also have a plasma instrument on the Discover mission which are still operational. But the thing is that that, the, that both uh, the SWIPAM on ACE as well as PSIL on wind have been operating for last almost like 20 years now. And uh, there is a plan to retire both these uh, spacecraft. So the advantage with the Swiss, Swiss, I mean, apart from the fact that both these instruments will retire, the, the other advantage with the Swiss instrument is that it provides a wider energy and FOB coverage when compared to the existing instruments at L1 point. And moreover, none of the instruments which are right now operational at L1 point uh, provides a simultaneous measurement uh, of the particle fluxes in the plane perpendicular to the ecliptic, which we can easily get using the Swiss instrument. Uh, moreover, as I have told you before, that since we can program the energy range as well as the number of steps during onboard operation, we could uh, we can actually uh, go for a targeted observation. So suppose if you want to scan a finite energy range with a very fast cadence, that is possible with the Swiss instrument. And the other uh, uh, salient feature of the uh, of the Swiss instrument is that uh, we are for the first time in India we are using these microchannel plate detectors with an RAE in-house developed for the for the sensor unit. So MCPs were earlier used in UVIT of uh, AstroSat mission, but again they were actually procured from Canadian Space Agency. So this, so like this is the first time we are actually qualifying these MCP detectors to be used for space application. I will quickly go through the device design and simulations. Uh, and these were like carried out in Simayan as well as in Comsol, mainly to finalize the design of the analyzer section as well as uh, uh, the detector configuration. So based on, based on the simulation results, we have uh, finalized the design as well as we have also characterized the instrument. So some of the results of simulation can be seen from the plots which are given uh, uh, in the bottom of this slide. So the bottom left figure shows you the typical elevation angle and the elevation angle energies uh, uh, response of the instrument. So this is how the instrument will accept the ions falling onto a particular, I mean, different energy falling onto a particular angle. Then uh, the figure on the, I mean, figure in the center shows you the typical radial deflection for different species. So for proton and alpha, how the species are deflected can be seen from this figure at different energies. And we have also characterized how the magnetic field pattern uh, looks like inside the magnetic mass analyzer region. So based on the simulations, we have fabricated the EM and then we tested EM uh, engineering model extensively. We verified its performance and then finally we have fabricated the uh, flight model. So uh, the three photographs which are shown in this slide gives you the uh, glimpse of the flight model which we have for the Swiss instrument.
So we have THA1, THA2, and the HV package. THA1 and THA2 are gold plated because of uh, thermal requirements. Um, now, as you can understand that for any uh, anything to fly on board, it needs to pass through some of the space qualification tests. So we have performed uh, uh, all the tests and evaluation which is required for the FM packages as per the QA guideline of the Space Application Center. And uh, we have now like we and we have also carried out the post performance measurements, uh, which we and we have tested all the functionality of the FM packages and have and like these were found to be satisfactory. We have now into, like in, uh, initiated the calibration of the FM batch hardware. So I'll just present some of the results of the FM batch hardware in a later slide. The figure shown in this uh, slide, the leftmost figure shows you the I mean THA1 and THA2 mounted on the tower uh, for the for in I mean for the vibration test setup, and the figure in the middle shows you the THA1 and THA2 mounted inside the thermal thermal vac chamber. I will come to the calibration plan, which we have for both these uh, uh, sensor units. So I mean, starting from the subsystem level calibration, which involves uh, calibration of the three major parts uh, of, of the instrument, which are the front front end electronics, high voltage power supply, and the MCP detector. So we have, I mean, this, this part has already been done. So subsystem level cal uh, calibration has been done for the FE. So we have verified the CSP again, as well as the position resolution, which we can uh, achieve using different FE settings. We have also obtained uh, uh, the position calibration using charge injection at different positions on the FE, as well as we have also verified the accuracy. For high voltage, we have tested its stability and linearity for continuous operation in thermovac as well as uh, in normal vacuum operation for more than seven to 10 days. Uh, we have also obtained the HV calibration in terms of the value which we apply and the value which is actually uh, which actually goes on the analyzer plate. So the DAC value versus the ADC monitor value, which we obtained for various uh, uh, analyzer plates inside the high voltage power supply. And for MCP detectors, we have verified all the functional parameters like, uh, the, uh, like the pulse height distribution, its uh, gain, as well as the FWHM of the pulse height distribution. We have also characterized the dark count at different bias voltages, uh, which were obtained as a, as a part of the qualification test. Uh, I mean, apart from these three, since uh, magnets were used in THA1 assembly, we have also taken into account any variation which we observed in the pole strength of different magnets. So based on the placement of the magnet, we have characterized how the magnetic field will look like inside the magnetic mass analyzer region. And based on that, we have also obtained, I mean, what deflections we expect once the ion fall into a particular section of the magnetic mass analyzer region. So uh, this slide shows you the overall instrument uh, calibration plan. So there are majorly four uh, parameters which requires uh, uh, calibration. Uh, these are energy, mass, flux, and direction. So for energy, we, we have uh, verified the ESA linearity. We have also checked the ESA resolution due, during different uh, tests, which we have carried out as a part of TND. And uh, there are some of, some of the tests which are pending, which we are now undertaking, like uh, the effect of incidence angle on ESA linearity and resolution, which we plan to do now. For mass, we have verified the position as well as FWHM at different energies. Uh, we now need to do some finer calibration, which involve like uh, 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 deciding on the focus voltages to be applied for different energies, as well as different FE settings, like the setting for uh, uh, different thresholds to be applied. For flux, uh, the conversion has to be done through geometric factor. We have now made an arrangement to actually obtain a ratio of the input to output flux inside the vacuum chamber. So that will be used for flux calibration. And we have also uh, like estimated various errors which we could obtain in flux due to different factors, uh, such as the logarithmic binning of the counts which we are doing on board, or due to different, uh, suppose, I mean, uh, or due to say the dark count of of the MCPs or cross talk across sectors. For direction calibration, we have an, like we have made a provision to rotate both the sensor units inside the vacuum chamber. So we can rotate the sensor units inside the vacuum chamber and align the uh, align one particular sector to the ion source so that we get a relation between the angular position versus uh, the, the sector which we record in our uh, front end electronics. So that has been done. Uh, we need to do the FOV acceptance of the THAs, which we intend to do now. 
Moreover, I mean, apart from these uh, uh, major uh, uh, calibration uh, part, the, the, other, the other thing is that since we are using magnets uh, inside the THA, and we also have a magnetometer on board the Aditya L1 spacecraft, we also need to retain the magnetic field so that uh, the, the leakage from our instrument does not affect the performance of the other instruments on board. So we have verified the magnetic leakage in THA1 engineering model. We need to do that in flight model, which we will take up now. As well as we also uh, would like to check the thermal performance, both, both in terms of the mass and the energy calibrations uh, for both the sensors. Uh, we also have a plan for onboard calibration of different units. So for MCP detector, we will be very big, like we will be periodically verifying its pulse height distribution, which will give us a value of its gain at different time, as well as its efficiency and dark count. For FE, we'll be doing electronic calibration for, for position estimation. Again, for HV, that will be based on a large data set. So we'll be continuously monitoring the HV values set minus monitor for a very large data set. And any change in that will give us a possible mismatch uh, in, in the energy values which we are recording. For flux, we'll be uh, doing a systematic, I mean, we'll be looking for a systematic offset for a long period of time. And suppose if we see such, uh, uh, such offset, we'll be cross calibrating it with external payload. So, so that is why your cross calibration plan also becomes important. So we have uh, a different plan for cross calibration. Uh, as I've told you before that we already have a particle spectrometer on board Aditya L1, which is developed by SPL, which is PAPA payload. So we have worked out a detailed plan uh, to how to cross calibrate our instrument with theirs. And uh, this will be done on the qualification model of both the payload, where, I mean, whereby we will be verifying both the energy pass as well as uh, bandwidth. And since we have both the instruments, so we'll be also doing the flux ratio comparison of proton and alpha particle for both these uh, payloads. Uh, also, 30 minutes are over. Yeah, yeah. We also have a plan for intercalibration with existing payloads at L1 points, in which you will be utilizing the level two data products of uh, ACE, Discover, and WIND. And, uh, uh, and, and I mean, this will be carried out during the payload verification or the PV phase of the instrument commissioning. Uh, we also have a plan to intercalibrate our payload with, a, with an upcoming experiment at L1 point. So NOAA, which is the US Agency for Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, is coming up with a, 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 a future payload, which a future mission on for space weather, which is known as SWFOL1. So it will have a particle spectrometer similar to Swiss. So we have already, I mean, we are already in discussion with them to how to how to intercalibrate our, our data with theirs. So I'll just quickly go through some of the ground calibration results which we have obtained. So the figure on the left shows you a typical setup which we have in our lab for uh, ground calibration. And on the right, you can see the ESA performance at different beam energies. So the topmost figure gives you the pass value of energies at different uh, uh, ion energy once you set the ESA to a particular voltage. The bottom uh, figure shows you the uh, ESA linearity as a function of different energies. Then you can also see the mass deflection uh, curves for diff at, at different energies for different species. So H plus is put on, and uh, as a proxy for alpha, we are using S2 plus. So that can be seen from the figure on the left. And uh, from all these figures, you can see that uh, in our lab spectrum, we always see a huge background, which comes due to nitrogen and the S2O plus, which always uh, exists inside the vacuum chamber. So what we do is that we remove Remove this contribution, we use the value of the peak position as well as the FWH of the proton and alpha peak, which we record in our lab spectrum. We remove the contribution of the background and then we generate some simulated spectrum. And based on the simulated spectrum, we then try to fit the, uh, fit the two peaks to obtain the relative flux of proton and alpha. And that has been done at different energies and the maximum errors, uh, which we expect to get in the flux value of proton and alpha are are shown in this uh, table, which is shown for different energies. So starting from 100 kV, it is roughly around 8%. For 20 kV, it will be around 17%. Uh, now we'll come to the operation and data product. So uh, this I've already told you that uh, there are nominally two modes of operation of the payload. Uh, uh, default mode in which the integration time is set at 450 millisecond. We also have a high cadence mode in which the integration time is 50 millisecond. And both the energy steps, I mean, typically uh, the default energy steps is 50. 
So 50 logarithmic steps between 100 EV to 20 kV. But this, but like this is programmable. So we can change the energy range as well as the number of uh, energy steps which we, which uh, I mean, which we need to scan. And uh, how it is done is that it is it is done through and uh, a, a payload proposal system. So all the observations which will be carried out using the Swiss instrument will be actually based on the proposals uh, submitted through Ajita L1 payload proposal submission system, which will be maintained by ISSDC. Uh, which is Israel Space Science Data Center. So they will maintain and they will host the, this web proposal system. Moreover, the observation time allocation as well as the duration of uh, the payload verification and the guaranteed time phase is currently being developed in the science working group of Hadith L1. So here on the right, so you are typical uh, setting and typical values which, which we can change during the instrument operation. So you can change the mode of operation, you can change the energy steps, you can change the energy range for both these token analyzers independently. Uh, coming on to the onboard data generation. So as you can understand, THA1, since THA1 has a magnetic mass separator, it, the, the spectral data size is uh, slightly larger than THA2. So the spectral data is something around 470 cross 6 bit compared to THA2, which is 160 cross 6 bit. And together, they generate a data of roughly around 1.3 GB per day. Uh, as far as data levels are concerned, we will have three different levels of data, starting from level zero, going up to level one, level two, and level three. So level zero is the raw data which we obtain from the spacecraft. Level one is the uh, is, is just a reorganization of the raw data. Uh, so we will let's just combine the valid payload frame and then we will derive the UT time from the zero data. Level two is will be the, our energy and direction differentiated counts from L1 data in different mass winds. And level three will be the highest level data, which will be uh, useful to the scientific community, which will be a value of direction differentiated flux per proton and alpha particles at each energy. Moreover, it will be also having the values of number density and uh, number density of proton and alpha, as well as the ratio and the bulk velocities of proton and alpha particles. Apart from this scientific uh, data, uh, starting on level zero to level three, we also have a near real time telemetry data uh, coming on from, from the spacecraft, which can be used for space weather forecasting or space weather applications. And the exact mechanism, how we will use this for space weather, uh, space weather applications is currently being discussed with the project team. Uh, so this is the final slide. Uh, the flow of the data is that we will get the level zero data from ISSDC. And then we have a POC, which, which, which we are developing here at PRL. POC is Payload Operation Center, which will convert the level zero data into level one, level two, and level three in different uh, format, in, in, in CDF format. And then that will be provided to ISSDC for archival and dissemination. So the metadata for this CDF will comply with the ISTP and ISCG guideline, which is widely used for all plasma physics experiment on board. We have, I mean, uh, right now what we have done is that we have developed this L0 to L1 software and we have tested it on uh, different lab data which we have generated using the flight model as well as engineering model. Moreover, as far as uh, the instrument uh, attitude orbit uh, uh, determination is concerned, we have uh, developed the instrument, the frame kernels uh, and, uh, and all other software elements which are shown on the figure on the right, starting from L0 to development of the L3 science data that are currently under development. So, okay, so this completes my talk. I hope I could give you a flavor of the instrument capability and other relevant details pertaining to the scientific data, which we aim to get from this instrument. So, yeah, so thank you once again for your patience okay. and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prashant, for this very nice overview of uh, Swiss. Um, any questions? Uh, so for uh, local participants, uh, please raise your hand. Our uh, volunteers there will take the question. And for online participants, uh, please raise your use raise uh, hand option, or you can type the question also in the chat box. So Naveen and others are there. I hope to take the question. And, uh, so is there any question there? Yeah, there's one question from the chat. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, please take the question here. Yeah. How is the HV programmatically varied? Okay. Ah, from the chart box. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 
so um see these are the high voltage power supply which we have the default energy steps are fixed so we have fixed some 50 logarithmic steps from 100 kv to uh, 20 kv but uh, the hv module which we have generates a uh, 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 like a uh, high voltage bias of uh, a constant high voltage bias of 3 kv which is then fed to an optocoupler driven circuit so based so so uh, so that is why we can actually vary the hv input so suppose if you supply some low voltages to the optocoupler corresponding to that we get a corresponding uh, lower high voltage so like these are not uh, hardwired into the uh, into the processing electronic these can be varied any time so any other question so no question i don't see any raised hands here at least okay uh, yeah if there's no other question uh, prashant i have a quick question can uh, when you said the energy resolution of uh, 10% of thh1 thh2 detector uh, i didn't follow what does it mean could you please explain it a bit yeah so 10% energy resolution means that suppose if we set our analyzer at a particular voltage suppose if we set it to scan say 1 kv particle so typically mm -hmm. it will scan from say 950 to 1050 kind of thing so that is the spread which it will allow through the electrostatic analyzer because uh, okay. uh, because the like esa has a channel width so it will have a, a sufficient as channel width to allow certain range of particles to come inside okay so for example if it's 10 kv it is like another 10% of that yeah yeah, yeah 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 okay so okay. like when i when i say 1 kv it is 1 kv plus i mean i mean 10% about 1 kv okay understood okay yeah so thank you and looks like there's no other no more questions um and if still there are questions if you could not ask now you can use the slack channel uh, to post your question and i think prashant will be happy to answer them uh so this uh, thank you uh, prashant and let me invite the next speaker um gundan jayaragun to present uh, on hydrax progress update Okay, I can yeah. see your. Uh, are you able to hear me as well? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I, I'll just be presenting an update today on. Uh, I'm going to be a postdoctoral professor at University of Kuala Lumpur, South Africa. I'll uh, provide an update today on the instrumentation developments pertaining to Hydrax. Hydrax is a hydrogen intensity and real-time analysis experiment, which is a telescope used to intensity map uh, the radiation from redshifted uh, spin flip hydrogen uh, transition. and it is being constructed presently at the karoo desert in south africa in the in the bottom you see uh, an array of uh, uh, institutes uh, around the world that are a part of uh, uh, hyrax which uh, funders contribute in kind and uh, from india ayuka is also a contributing uh, member so without uh, further ado i just uh, get into the uh, talk so we started the beginning of the universe so the big bang happened after that the universe uh, expanded in a um, in, in a phase of rapid expansion called the inflation and uh, close to 400000 years later uh, we started uh, the, the the photon started decoupling from the uh, plasma soup and started escaping out as the cosmic microwave background and uh, telescopes like planck cobe uh, and w map uh, map actually this uh, surface of plasma scattering so uh, from the early observations of cmb uh, if one thing was found it was that uh, uh, there was a uniform uh, it, it was always uh, that the temperature was constant around 2.7 uh, uh, kelvin and um, uh, it was initially thought to be homogeneous and isotropic uh, but after uh, some time when uh, people tried to like uh, subtract the monopole component with the dipole component and uh, try to like go deeper uh, into uh, into into the fluctuations of cmb what was identified was that there were uh, fluctuations of the order of few hundreds of uh, microkelvin a uh, few hundreds of microkelvin and uh, this uh, when when one when, when tried to uh, try to see the power spectrum of these fluctuations uh, one got a spectrum like what is uh, shown Uh, in, in the in the bottom right corner and these had very distinct peaks at uh, angular scales of 1 degrees and uh, and its and its um, uh, harmonics like 0.5 degrees 0.25 degrees etc and so uh, these um, uh, uh, these 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 peaks are thought to like uh, come from some kind of an oscillation which was set up during the period from the big bang to the recombination line so uh, this is mostly attributed to so so uh, during the time of uh, uh, big bang and up to the time that we reached the uh, recombination 
So what basically happened was like the ions and the photons were actually in a plasma suit and the photon was not able to come out because it was scattered of free electrons and the ions present in that uh, primordial plasma suit. And uh, the, the, the ions and other baryons were sort of attracted towards, uh, uh, attracted to form clumps due to uh, some kind of gravitational contribution, gravitational force which was provided by the dark matter, while the photons were trying to like restore uh, this uh, back. So that like, uh, uh, so, so, so this uh, set up kind of oscillations, which were acoustic in nature because there was a, a perturbation in the density of the of the matter present there, and uh, during the recombination, when uh, uh, when when photons were able to decouple successfully from baryons and escape out as CMB, these uh, actually got frozen into uh, uh, the time scale from uh, the inflation uh, time scale from uh, the Big Bang up to up to the up to the recombination, creating these uh, kind of uh, structures called the uh, uh, structure uh, called the BAO, and the scale size of this BAO is like constant. Uh, like uh, wherever we see them, uh, all the all their process type. This makes them something like a standard ruler, similar to type one supernovae that we use as standard candles. So standard rulers are uh, things to which we can like reference our links to, and we know that uh, these rulers are going and uh, they can be used to like sort of uh, measure uh, um, uh, how how much the universe is expanding, and also like a more more important constant such as the Hubble constant and etc. And uh, so so basically, uh, uh, there have been like many uh, uh, efforts to characterize this uh, using optical wavelengths. And uh, uh, one such uh, image that I've added is that of a survey conducted by this telescope called Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And uh, they sort of like tried to uh, map out galaxies all the way up to uh, redshift of one and more recently. And uh, so, and when they tried to like see the power spectrum, they got a power law kind of a slope. And once they tried to remove the smooth component of the fit, they started seeing these oscillations at uh, scales of 0.1 to 0.3 uh, uh, h per megaparsecs. So uh, here, basically, like these scales are what is uh, the, uh, or what which corresponds to the the BAO oscillations. And using these scales, one would be able to constrain uh, the equation, the, the equation of state, the, the dark energy equation of state, and how the universe expansion happened and how the large scale structures were formed initially. But the uh, problem with optical surveys beyond a redshift of one is that uh, as we go, as we want to look farther and farther into the universe, we start losing the, the sources, the, the clusters became like, become less brighter. So because of which we have to like look into a particular portion of the sky and do long integrations. And also uh, because of the spectroscopic nature of the study, we need to identify individual galaxies and their properties need to be measured very uh, precisely. So an alternate solution uh, to like overcome this uh, limitation to see deeper into the, uh, into the evolution of the universe, into like higher redshift, is something called intensity mapping, which can be done using, uh, which can be done in the radio wave things. So, and a useful uh, tracer for this is the spin flip uh, transition of hydrogen, which occurs because of uh, the electron in the hydrogen atom uh, flipping its spin from upspin to downspin. And this sort of emits uh, radiation at 14, 20 megahertz or 21 centimeters. And uh, when, um, like we, and, and, and this radiation is like almost ubiquitous in uh, nature because like uh, you need hydrogen to form stars and this galaxies and this clusters. So this sort of acts as a bias tracer of uh, where galaxies and galaxy clusters are present and as we like go deeper into uh, uh, the universe we, uh, the, this uh, line starts shifting to lower and lower frequencies and uh, in this case when uh, and, and so intensity mapping is based on this premise that instead of like mapping trying to map independent galaxies we just try to map whole regions of the sky where there are thousands of galaxies and we just try to like find the uh, find the integrated co integrated contribution from all these uh, galaxies and from there construct uh, a map of uh, uh, how the clustering is happening, and then uh, work it uh, work out directly to reach the uh, power spectrum uh, uh, power spectrum uh, power spectrum uh, domain directly uh, through uh, interferometric measurements as well. So uh, the advantage here is, like I said, we don't need to identify individual galaxies, and we can do the we can survey the same region of sky at a much faster rate than what we would do with an optical thing. So just to uh, like. Um, the, the utility of hydrogen uh, uh, spin flip transition cannot be understated in, uh, in, 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 in cosmology. So if we see uh, like 1420 megahertz, which is there on the top of the screen, is uh, the rest frequency of uh, the hydrogen spin flip transition, which is what we will observe when one tries to uh, like take a horn out, point it to some portion of the galaxy, and depending on the velocity of how fast we are moving with respect to the spiral arm, it will get it shifted or blue shifted. But once we want to go like uh, deeper into the universe's history, so somewhere here, uh, beyond like a thousand redshift is uh, the, the epoch of recombination. And after that, uh, like uh, we have the dark ages where we did not, uh, where, where we did not have any optical emission. So we don't actually know what went on there. And there are like a few missions like uh, Pratush, uh, which I think Mayuri is presenting tomorrow or the day after, and also Dapper, which is presented by, which is uh, 
uh, a space mission by University of Colorado. And then we have got a few uh, uh, telescopes that are trying to like detect the signature, global signature from EOR, like for example, Saras, Edges, and also Sitara, which is uh, being set up in Australia. And also the hydrogen network of the uh, uh, telescope, which is the HERA, uh, which is also being set up in South Africa. And all these uh, like correspondingly work in a frequency range of uh, uh, 40 to 200 uh, megahertz, which is where the UR signature is uh, expected to be there. And uh, after the reunion was complete and the first galaxies uh, formed, uh, and sometime later, around uh, 0 0.5 to 2.5 redshifts, we had the uh, large scale uh, structure for the evolution of the large scale structure formation, which is sort of being probed by uh, instruments like SIME, uh, Green Bank, Meerkat, Hyrax, and uh, GMRT, and also like a telescope called Bingo in Brazil. So, if we uh, look at uh, the telescopes like GMRT, Meerkat, Green Bank, etc., these, uh, these are like general purpose radio telescopes where there are dedicated programs to. Uh, uh, study uh, this uh, large scale uh, structure formation of the universe. But telescopes like SIME, Hyrax, uh, and also like HERA, uh, etc., are built specifically to uh, uh, pick out the signature. So they are more optimized to uh, pick out the right scales and uh, they are supposed to have the right amount of sensitivity in order for us to like uh, pick, out, uh, the, the, pick out the emission from these things in a, in a proper fashion. So this brings me to my next slide where I introduce the instrument uh, Hyrax. So this is uh, basically. Uh, an array of 1024 antennas located in the radio by Karu region. So if you can um, see this particular plot, this was an RFA measurement that was a uh, measurement of radio frequency interference, which was taken at uh, the main site of Hyrax. And the band in which we are operating from 0.4 to 0.8 megahertz, so 0.4 to 0.8 gigahertz, which corresponds to uh, uh, a redshift of uh, 0.5, 2.5 approximately, is completely clean. We don't have even, uh, we don't have any uh, terrestrial transmitters. and uh, and, and even even the magnitude of the transmitters that are like the other other way, uh, other frequencies are close to like minus 80 so these don't like pose uh, any problem of even like getting alias into the band on an instantaneous level and creating uh, uh, saturation issues with amplifiers etc and so uh, at this at this point of time uh, we, we are planning to go ahead with uh, building a 256 element pathfinder of six meter dishes for which we have uh, uh, acquired full funding and the final array is supposed to have 1024 elements and uh, both these array uh, and uh, once the two physics element array is in place at uh, the main site the remaining inst the instrument will be like upgraded after we get preliminary results in the two physics element array and also funding for uh, adding the remaining elements and uh, we also plan to have a uh, because because of the fact that dishes the dishes that are being used here are not commercially available and they are being specially made for uh, use in the experiment we are uh, planning to like have a dish verification array at a site called clairefontein which is uh, very close to the Meerkat telescope, and there is uh, uh, infrastructure available for us readily to characterize the array. And uh, in terms of power supply and everything, uh, in terms of power supply and uh, testing measurement instruments, which will be provided by the square kilometer array, uh, arrays um, uh, stations there. And uh, yeah, and like I said, the main aim of the array is to uh, uh, measure the signature of the baryonic acoustic oscillations and use that to constrain and uh, use that to like place constraints on uh, the dark energy equation of state. An ancillary goal is to like use this array to uh, uh, search for FRBs and uh, do some pulsar timing with it. So, I'm good in ten minutes, sir. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so here I just show the sky coverage uh, of Hyrax, and here we basically see that uh, we cover almost the entire southern sky, and we also have quite an amount of overlap with other experiments like the C uh, uh, Dark Energy Survey and, uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 millimeter experiments like ACT pool. Uh, these two plots in the bottom are just the angular scale and the frequency separation. So frequency separation is there is um, important to measure the line of sight component of the scale variation, and the angular scale is important to measure the uh, plane of sky uh, component of the variation. And we see that uh, Hyrax is well equipped to like sample both um, sufficiently. Uh, here I'm just like presenting some uh, uh, forecasts that were uh, 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 obtained based on some simulations, and we see that uh, for forecasting both the amplitude of the, the power spectrum amplitude. And as well as the distance scale and uh, and the the parameters of the dark energy equation of state and also the parameters that dominate the dark energy uh, that dominate large scale structures are constrained very tightly uh, when uh, combining Hyrax uh, uh, data with uh, data from Planck and other telescopes. So uh, and uh, like like I said, like we are also like uh, aiming to uh, like detect FRBs. So this uh, here is the coverage of, is the UV coverage of the Hyrax. Uh, uh, main array and this is the synthesized beam. The synthesized beam of the Hyrax uh, main array is like five arc minutes wide. So because of this, we will not be able to get like a really nice localization. So because of this, we have also planned to like use uh, uh, outrigger arrays all over uh, Africa. 
So we, the longest east-west baseline will be from with Mauritius, and the longest north-south baseline will be, will be with Ames, Rwanda. And uh, when we try to uh, find the UV coverage, snapshot UV coverage for that particular uh, uh, for these set of antennas, we uh, obtain a, uh, and Fourier transform it. We obtain a synthesized beam of like almost 60 million milliarc seconds, which should provide sufficient localization for us to even uh, uh, pinpoint uh, the location of the Furbies within uh, galaxies. So this is our uh, prototype uh, uh, station at uh, Hartley Stokes Radio Astronomy uh, Observatory. So it also hosts a big 27 meter uh, uh, deep space network dish. And uh, this uh, antenna here is the one which I was talking about, which is specifically being made for Hyrax. And uh, this is a prototype which was made for us by a, uh, by a company within South Africa. And the diameter of the antenna is 6 meters, and that it has got an F number of 0.25. And it, is, uh, it has got dual polarized sweeps and can be tilted from minus 30 to plus 30 degree. And uh, this is the arrangement of the front end electronics at the feed. So uh, this here is the RF or fiber transmitter. And we've got the bias this here, uh, followed by uh, the amplifiers. Uh, uh, amplifiers and the band pass filters and the output of this uh, basically goes to the um, RF or fiber transmitter where the RF signal is being intensity modulated with an optical signal and is being transmitted onto the uh, onto the receiver room. So here at the receiver room, we actually have this uh, ice board which is uh, the which basically acts as the F engine. So here we have got uh, um, 16 uh, ADC channels uh, which sit on a Kintec 7 FPGA board. Uh, through FMC connectors and uh, the data is like uh, uh, packetized. Uh, sorry, the data is Fourier transformed and uh, polyphase filtered to like uh, improve channel isolation. And then it is also packetized and then transmitted. Uh, and then and then we have a back plane to which like 16 such, such boards will connect for the two phase element array. And in the back plane, the corner turning, uh, the transposition of the time and frequency channels happens in the back plane. And after which the data is passed on to the GPU where uh, the X engine is implemented. Along with the extension, we also have the pulsar search and the FRB search personalities running in parallel. So, yeah. So uh, this uh, I, uh, I show have less than a minute, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I show here some preliminary RFI uh, subtraction strategies that we are using, but we are going to like we are also like trying to improve upon uh, this by uh, uh, making the data in a format that will be compatible with deep and so that we can use the, the pre-built RFI. Uh, 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 mitigation tools there and here i'm just showing a drip scan uh, observation of the dish when it was pointed to the direction of centaurus a which is like minus 18 degrees of the zenith and uh, these yellow lines show uh, spectrum cuts which we have taken to uh, uh, do a y factor measurement of the dish and um, here in the bottom we show the noise temperature measurement and we see that uh, when you are doing the y factor measurement and also in the dynamic spectrum there is a portion between uh, 550 to 700 uh, where actually the gain is like much lower than the other frequencies. So because of this, we see an increased uh, noise uh, temperature in the band of 550 to 700 by at least like three to four uh, times. While in the uh, while all over the other band, it is only like around 100 Kelvin. Uh, 100 Kelvin is still 2x greater than what we were targeting. But then like we are still in the process of figuring out like why the noise temperature is higher than we expected and what are the contributions which lead to this increase in the system temperature. So to summarize the talk, uh, Hyrax will like, complement SIME and other uh, surveys and other wavelengths uh, to um, uh, enable auto and cross correlation studies of large scale structures. Before the end of this year, we envisioned that uh, we would uh, commence the mass production of the dishes and we would have the verification array at uh, Clarefontaine, which will like, give us a better understanding of the cross coupling between the feeds and the dishes and uh, how to uh, mitigate them. We are also like planning to be, uh, uh, deploy an outrigger station at uh, Botswana International University of Science and Technology and demonstrate VLBA between Hartrow and uh, Buist to, uh, by, by using the standard, uh, by, by using probably some strong southern hemisphere pulsar like Vela. And we are also applying holography observations to like, get a better understanding of the, the, the dish and its performance using uh, the 12 meter and the 15 meter dishes that are present at Hartrow. Uh, simultaneously, uh, the calibration of uh, the dish using drones are being uh, considered being uh, researched upon at uh, uh, our collaborators at Yale and uh, ETH in Switzerland. So uh, the final array is uh, two physical element arrays planned to be commissioned fully by the end of 2025. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mukundan. I'm uh, um, sorry, we um, yeah, sure. are already running late. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, I can't take the questions. Uh, but uh, of course, yeah, you, I urge you to put the, uh, post the question in chat box as well as in the Slack uh, channel. Okay. And I think Mukundan will be happy to answer your questions. Yes, sure. uh, yeah, Can I stop sharing? share the slide. Yeah, okay. Ah, yeah. And Thanks. now uh, let me invite Pawan Kumar to uh, make his presentation on dynamic performance uh, verification of VLC. Uh, 
Pawan, you can share the screen. Yes. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, I hope I'm audible and uh, my presentation is a full, full screen. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. So Good afternoon, all. Uh, myself, Pavan Kumar, and uh, today I'll be presenting about the dynamic performance uh, verification of uh, VLC onboard Aditya L1. So uh, basically, this uh, VLC onboard Aditya L1 is an instrument uh, dedicated for the solar study at uh, multiple wavelengths. So this presentation uh, gives an overview of uh, the lab model which we had built for qualifying. Uh, uh, for uh, various environmental tests and how it was constructed uh, and the major difference between the uh, lab model and the flight model. The finite element analysis, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was done for the lab model and the overall test, environmental test conducted and the final results, which was uh, created. So the image, bottom image shows the uh, open view of uh, the VLC uh, uh, payload. Uh, next, uh, uh, basically, this VLC uh, lab model uh, consisted of 18 optomechanic assemblies, four detector DHAs at four different channels, and uh, four baffles. One, uh, pro two primary baffles, one secondary baffle, uh, and uh, one exit baffle. And the overall uh, volume uh, of this uh, payload was uh, 1.7 meter in length and 1.1 1 .1 meter in width and 0.5 meter in height. And the uh, major uh, uh, thing what, which was given to us was all these uh, subsystems uh, should be uh, having a global stiffness of more than 200 hertz. And payload as, uh, as such uh, with all the sub assemblies should be more than uh, 100 hertz. Um, and basically, this payload is mounted on uh, eight lugs, aluminum lugs, which will be mounted on satellite interface. And uh, uh, this uh, sub assemblies uh, uh, in general uh, was uh, totally exper will, uh, was, uh, experienced to sign acoustic and random vibration, where sign uh, underwent uh, 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 the vibration covering a band of 5 to 100 hertz, and acoustics and random uh, covered a band of 5 to 2000 hertz. And basically, we had built a mass inertia model of uh, aluminium uh, built from AL6061 P6, complete model. Uh, it, it, was, it was one is to one scale as a flight model. Uh, this was to basically evaluate the load spectrum, uh, which it is going to experience in the final flight. And uh, this uh, resonance frequency, uh, which was extracted from the test after the test, uh, was uh, mapped with the analysis result, and which was closely matching. I will explain the uh, uh, overall uh, comparison. And uh, after the sign, uh, acoustic sign and random, uh, the integrity of the payload was tested uh, uh, using uh, uh, alignment cubes by our optics team. I will explain that also in uh, thorough in the next slides. So this is a basic comparison. I will give a major comparison here. The left model, what we are seeing here is the uh, lab model, which was a uh, mass inertia model, which was built out of uh, aluminum AL6061. And this photo was taken in uh, Professor M.G. in lab. So basically, as I had explained, uh, the opto optomechanical bench, optomechanical assemblies, and side covers, uh, everything was in general built from aluminum. Whereas in real case, in the flight model, uh, various components are uh, being deployed, such as titanium and invar uh, for uh, structural elements, and in optical for optical, zero dar, NBK7, and other optical materials were used. And uh, and in terms of the major uh, change, what we had done was uh, the primary uh, mirror mount. Uh, initially, the configuration when before the uh, maturity of the design, this, uh, there were three bolt configuration to mount it to the optical bench. But in the flight model, uh, currently it is a five bolt uh, uh, configuration, which uh, we will see in the uh, later slides. What were the what this difference had in the had an impact on the final test, and overall the mass was uh, there was a mass difference of 60 kilograms, uh, whereas in the lab model it was uh, close to 90 kgs. The final flight model is around 150 kgs. So there, uh, there was an expert committee uh, formed uh, for uh, uh, preparing this uh, lab model for the environmental tests. Uh, and the major suggestions are as follows. Uh, in flight model, there are only there are uh, uh, self-locking helicoils, which is a uh, like foolproof method for uh, for all the uh, space applications where the bolt doesn't uh, get loosened and uh, get free. But whereas in the lab model, we had only uh, 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 normal uh, tapping uh, on on an uh, aluminum bench. So the committee suggested that we'll go with an SS board with a split washer and uh, a drop of scotch well uh, that with the EC2216 so that the bolts doesn't come off. And the second one was to check the integrity of the model. Uh, two alignment cubes was uh, deployed uh, inside the payload, not inside the payload, one inside the payload and uh, one on the optical bench. 
to be precise, uh, uh, one on the backside rear of the primary mirror mount and uh, one on the optical bench. A correlation was built uh, in between these two alignment cubes. And post the vibration tests, uh, uh, this coordinates of the uh, coordinates was uh, of the optical uh, uh, alignment cube was checked, and uh, the final results was uh, summarized. And uh, nextly, uh, coming to the actual test, uh, there was a vibration fixture uh, of 1.8 meter length and 1.5 meter width. A 40 mm thickness vibration fixture was designed and uh, realized. Uh, we can see the analysis at the right side uh, image. Uh, it was having a good frequency of more than 200 hertz. And uh, this was made out of aluminium, and uh, the overall ma mass was 250 kilogram. Uh, firstly, this particular uh, vibration fixture alone was characterized in the 29 ton shaker at Istro facility. And uh, this had a very good frequency, and there was no uh, uh, low, low band uh, resonance was found with a very uh, low amplitude, with a good frequency was found at uh, the uh, vibration fixture uh, standalone test. And now these are the series of 15 tests which was conducted on the lab model uh, uh, VLC uh, model. Uh, starting the three tests are low level acoustic test and uh, qualification test and low level acoustic test. There are two tests you are seeing as a repetition. That is to map the signature. What, are the, what is the pre and post of uh, the qualification level? And consecutively, there were uh, three, uh, three tests done uh, at all axes, uh, X, Y, Z. That is roll, pitch, and yaw. Uh, now, these are the test specification which was given by ISO. Uh, the left uh, two columns are uh, uh, of random vibration. One is for on axis, other for off axis. Uh, at the right, we are seeing the uh, sine vibration inputs. Uh, we can see uh, the spectrum frequency spectrum is 5 to 100 hertz for sine. For, uh, for random, it is for, from 20 to 2000. And uh, random at qualification level, we ran it for 10 G uh, uh, with a, a speed rate of 2 octave per minute. And at uh, out of access, uh, we ran it for 5G for two, two, uh, two octaves per minute. So uh, there were a massive uh, 58 number of accelerometers which was mounted uh, in and out of the uh, payload. Uh, this shows uh, various locations at uh, subsystems where the accelerometer was uh, fixed. I'm sure at the left top is the isometric view and uh, at the right we have the plan view. And at the bottom we are showing the cover enclosed view where we had had a couple of uh, accelerometers on the cover also. So this is actual model, uh, actual lab model, which was uh, uh, photo was taken where uh, uh, all the accelerometers were mounted and characterized. And just before the test, uh, the photo was taken. Uh, next, these are the uh, accelerometer nomenclature where uh, you can see I had put three tables uh, at various location and what are the subsystems. And uh, overall, if you see 58 accelerometers were mounted uh, for, for uh, conducting this test. And uh, these are the test results uh, of uh, the first one says about acoustic test. In acoustic, we did not find any major uh, uh, changes in the alignment cube, as well as there was no uh, resonant frequencies found. In X axis, uh, we faced some minor uh, things like a uh, couple of uh, uh, bolt nuts uh, were loosened up uh, at X axis at qualification level test, but that was outside the payload. And uh, after that, we checked the uh, alignment cubes. There was no coordinate mismatch, and there was no signature uh, mismatch and at the uh, low-level uh, scientist. Again, when coming to y-axis test, which is that yaw, yaw axis, uh, one, bo one bolt got loosened, and uh, a slight noise, uh, shrill noise was heard at uh, three frequencies, roughly at 35 hertz, 50 hertz, and 70 hertz. But uh, there were no signature difference, and there were no changes in the coordinates of the alignment cube. And Z-axis went uh, very smoothly without uh, any issues, and all the signatures were matching. So now uh, I'm coming to the next next sector, that is the finite element analysis of the same uh, lab model. Uh, the previous what we saw was actual test. Now uh, we are seeing the uh, simulation. Five analyses were done. Uh, one is the free-free analysis, uh, sat, uh, modal analysis, static analysis, and in dynamic we did sign and random analysis. The current table what you're seeing here is of a free-free analysis. Basically, the free free analysis is uh, to find the health of the health and integrity of the model where there are no, to check that where there are no uh, loose elements. So if you see the first six modes, uh, X, X, Y, Z, theta X, theta Y, theta Z are all of uh, minus 10 power minus 4, which, which shows that the model is very healthy. And uh, next, uh, this uh, table uh, shows uh, the modal analysis. Totally, uh, uh, we had ran uh, the analysis for up to 500 hertz, which gave us 318 modes. 
380 modes, uh, and and I have shown here the first 20 modes, which is having the major uh, major uh, mass participation. The first three frequencies are uh, 48 hertz, 79 hertz, and 80 hertz. And of course, these three or this five uh, modes, five frequencies are not uh, global resonance, uh, global frequency. These are all local frequencies. The major uh, global frequency starts from 97 to 101 hertz. I will show the uh, simulation model. Uh, the first two models are the uh, local modes, what we've seen. Uh, if you see here, this is the primary mirror mode, uh, which is of 48 hertz. And one is of the one of the BHCs showed the second mode at 79 hertz. The global mode uh, started only after 97 hertz and 101 hertz uh, consecutively, which, showed the, which shows that uh, uh, the model or the, uh, uh, the lab model is very uh, stiff, stiff enough. And this is a test uh, summer uh, result. Uh, uh, summer result. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll finish it. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is a this a test summary gives uh, uh, the difference in uh, responses from uh, the actual test as well as the simulation in all axes, roll, yaw, and pitch, X, Y, and Z. Uh, the first uh, column I have uh, shown about the system performance ratios, the sensor ID, and the next two uh, consecutive uh, says the test as well as simulation, X, Y, and Z. It is observed that the overall responses were closely matching with analytical, analytical estimates. Uh, I, I've shown just a couple of uh, 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 analysis uh, plots uh, because I had uh, roughly 80, 90 plots. I just have uh, shown the primary mirrors plot and uh, some of the heavier uh, mirror plots. And this uh, sine vibration uh, shows uh, the roll axis in the roll axis. If you see, there are uh, very less amplification at uh, zero to 100 hertz. This is for uh, primary mirror near the optical bench, and the right one plot shows at one x, one y, and one z. That is at out of axis. Uh, this is at uh, M1, the primary mirror top, and prim uh, primary mirror pitch side. And the right column I had shown here. Uh, show this is uh, on one of the heavier optics, the litro assembly, which this particular assembly alone is weighing around 13 kilograms. So this is the uh, output plot of uh, the litro assembly, and uh, this is at your axis at same uh, primary mirror y, y, z directions. And one more plot on continuum and linear scan mechanism. I had shown on one of the mechanisms over here, which you see uh, the response are uh, very, uh, very, very negligible. Uh, one, and finally on the uh, pitch axis, uh, that is on the z axis. I'm showing it on the primary mirror mount and one on the uh, IR detector. So finally, after uh, the, uh, the lab model test and the verification on the uh, 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 FE analysis, we came to, we have come to a conclusion that the resonant frequency of uh, the analysis and the tests are very closely matching. Uh, but the frequency of uh, certain uh, uh, subsystems were not matching in the sense, the frequency band was matching, but the frequency uh, response, the peak responses uh, were differing. Some were high and some were low. And uh, what we could conclude here was in, in analysis, the assumption or uh, the input value of the viscous damping was two percentage. Uh, but whereas in the actual model, actual damping would have uh, taken care and the attenuation difference might have caused this is what the conclusion is. And one of the major difference uh, what we have uh, seen is that as I had explained, uh, the primary mirror had faced a local uh, resonance at 45 hertz. This is uh, majorly because of the configuration I had, as what I had explained. Uh, that is with the three volt configuration and the five volt configuration, which is in the uh, primary mount and which was uh, both checked in analysis uh, and uh, it was closely matching in the test as well as in the analysis. So I uh, am sure that uh, uh, this uh, presentation will give an uh, overall view of the uh, dynamic test conducted on the lab model. I, I am done with this. Um, thank you, Pawan. And yeah, yeah thank you for finishing well in, uh, well in time. Uh, any question? So please raise your hand or yeah, Gaurav uh, or Atkar, please go ahead. Please unmute and ask your question. Hello. Hi. Uh, now I am able to unmute myself. Uh, thanks for yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, great talk. Thanks for it. Just curious, what was the reason behind the noise that you heard at those three frequencies you mentioned briefly in the uh, in one of your slides? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. The answer uh, say. Uh, if you see, there was some uh, uh, primary baffle, which is a slender member, which is very thin. Uh, we concluded that there were uh, two possibilities. One in the primary baffle, you could have heard the noise. And one, the uh, cell level, the, uh, the mount cells we lab, 
that is a very uh, flimsy uh, uh, flimsy uh, what do you say a leaf uh, kind of uh, configuration so these were the two uh, two places where we concluded that the noise would have uh, arisen okay uh, any any question uh, uh, local in the auditorium navin or other volunteers okay okay so any other question in the online participants from the online participants okay looks like i don't see any the raised hand or question typed in the chat box so let's move on to the next speaker next speaker is uh, vipin k yadav on uh, viper on board indian venus orbiter mission please Okay, we can see your screen. Yeah, it is in presentation. Oh, yeah, you can start. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Also. Yeah. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, all, and uh, thanks for to the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity. I I feel sorry for the audience. I wanted to attend it in person, but uh, actually, I'm not in Trivandrum. I I'm at Chennai now. There was some uh, unavoidable work uh, that has come in between, but uh, nevertheless, uh, so. i am going to discuss today uh, the venus ionospheric plasma wave detector uh, that is the short name is viper on board indian venus orbiter mission so it's a, it's a payload which is already shortlisted for the incoming uh, for the uh, uh, upcoming uh, venus uh, orbiter mission uh, yeah so the objectives basically for this viper that we have uh, associated are there are two kinds of objectives one is the primary objective that we are certain to to achieve with this uh, instrument and the second one is the secondary that with the help of other payloads on board we are we are going to try some other uh, scientific uh, objectives also so the first one is to study the plasma phenomena uh, that is uh, going around venus by explore, exploring uh, it in in, in uh, prevailing localization means Uh, you you have an ionosphere but the plasma extend well be you know ionosphere and the some of the phenomena that we are going to try to see with this particular instrument are actually not localized in ionospheric itself they extend beyond that so the total plasma environment around venus we we want to study the second is the study of interplanetary and induced magnetic field now two kinds of magnetic fields are there in uh, around venus the first one is the imf that is coming over there and the second one is the induced uh, magnetic field that is basically getting generated inside the ionosphere because of the uh, incoming uh, uh, charged particle so now because of the magneto hydrodynamic motion that is it so these two kind of magnetic fields also we want to see and the the main objective basically with all these studies is to detect and observe the venusian plasma waves and to explore their role in modulating the plasma dynamics around venus so these three basically comprise our primary objectives and of course there are secondary objectives that we are going to try with uh, with uh, the with scientific uh, inputs from other payloads the, that one is to study the plasma energy distribution in the venus plasma environment around venus and to study the plasma heating around uh, venus and the particle acceleration from venus and eventually their escape from the venusian plasma environment so these are our objectives that we are planning to do with this particular instrument now let me begin with the uh, uh, so what all missions have gone so far. actually I, if i would say so it's a step motherly behavior as far as venus and mars are concerned uh, in regard to the plasma wave detection okay there are some 23 to 27 missions which have gone but only you can see four were there which were having some plasma wave instruments on board like for example marina 10 magnetometer then pvo is the one that we you, you can say was having the best uh, uh, possible instrumentation on board to basically study the plasma waves they were having electric field detectors they were having magnetometers they were having electron temperature probe basically it's a langmuir probe and you have an rp a retarded potential analyzer to measure the ion temperature so otherwise you can see venera only magnetometer was there and of course venus express also only magnetometer was there there were some other supporting instruments also which i have listed in this last column over here so as far as plasma waves are concerned venus is not that much explored and there are still some uh, area which is left unexplored that is what we are going to target with our uh, payload this viper payload so just to uh, start this thing you have a planet over here and then you have a neutral atom surrounding it which basically makes the atmosphere now what happens the solar radiation comes and the uv part of that solar radiation ultraviolet part basically ionizes photoionizes 
this neutral uh, atmosphere around that and then the ionosphere gets generated now once this ionosphere gets gen generated the solar wind comes and then you know create a wake kind of a thing at the back side of the uh, that particular planet and once the, these things form then you know that imf comes along with the solar wind and then you have all sorts of magnetic barriers different boundaries such as the ionopause plasma pass magnetic sheet magneto tail bow shock all these things then comes into existence and after that only that plasma wave also starts coming uh, into picture around this area so this is the how uh, the, the basically the evolution of the plasma environment and the subsequent phenomena that takes place inside that one so then what happens is that plasma waves, why, what are they and why they are important basically, any planetary body which is having an ionosphere in which the plasma density is in the range of 10 to power 3, that means 1000 to 10 to 2, about a million per centimeter cube. If it is this kind of a density is there and a plasma temperature of around 0.1 EV. We in plasma physics, we basically designate the temperature by electron volt. One electron volt is equal to 11,600 Kelvin. Okay. So if this kind of plasma environment is there, you can have a plasma waves around that. Now they are observed in almost all the solar system objects, which, such as the sun, the planets, the planetary satellites, interplanetary medium, comets, etc. And this is how actually what I was telling is you have a solar radiation photoionization takes place. The atmosphere basically converts into a part of that converts into ionosphere. And in this ionosphere, because of random motion of plasma particles, free energy sources are created, which basically leads to the instabilities. And instabilities basically means the, uh, the non-linear build, energy buildup inside the plasma and the plasma when the plasma is not able to hold on this excess of energy is it relaxes by releasing the extra energy which basically comes out in the form of plasma waves so why these plasma waves are significant they are because the, their studies can give you the vital information regarding magnetospheric physics solar wind then plasma interaction, the energy distribution in plasma, generation of plasma, uh, radio emission, etc. And it can provide valuable information, the structure and dynamics of the atmosphere. And it can be used as a plasma, uh, as a tool for plasma diagnostics for those particular areas where in situ observations are not possible. For example, the solar corona, where the temperature is about a million or so, and we cannot make any in situ measurements for plasma over there. So as far as Venus is concerned, if we take from 10 to 90, 900 uh, kilometer altitude, these are the values that you see the plus, the electron density electron temperature ion density ion temperature and the magnetic field which is uh, basically this is imf i am talking about and and the induced one together so you can have minimum field of 50 nanotesla and maximum 150 nanotesla now when these kind of ingredients you have what even these values basically i have taken from the pvo which which basically set as the benchmark for any plasma measurements that we are going to do in future so with this kind of a, a ingredients, what we see over there. So these are the possible plasma waves that can exist in if these kind of plasma parameters are there. You can have Whistler waves, you can have lower hybrid waves, you can have ion acoustic waves, you can have Lavinia waves, you can have proton cyclotron waves, electron cyclotron waves, ion cyclotron waves, and mixed mode waves. And these are the species, basically the waves which with their species which they are associated like electron, ion, ion, electron, like that, and their nature, whether they are electromagnetic or electrostatic or quasi electrostatic so these are the possibilities that we have to look for uh, for as far as plasma waves is concerned around venus and what has happened so far the present scenario is something like this that whistler lower hybrid ion acoustic langmuir and proton cyclotron these all are observed and the, the year and mission is put over here and the instrument which were used to detect these waves is put over here so what is left with us the bottom three the cyclotron waves the electron cyclotron waves, ion cyclotron waves, and mixed mode waves. And what kind of instrumentation we need for that? We basically, uh, yeah, and why, why are these waves are important? Because electron cyclotron waves can basically uh, transport electrons from Venus. Ion cyclotron wave basically can heat the plasma particles to uh, basically ions to such high velocities that ultimately they are lost. And mixed mode waves basically can, uh, then can heat the, uh, the ionosphere or basically increase the temperature of the ions. And so the, these are not detected, as I told, and these is the observed or the expected frequency of these waves, which are been, which has been estimated in the, some, something in the range of kilohertz, something in the range from uh, tens of hertz to hundreds of hertz, and 10 to 500 megahertz mixed mode waves. So what kind of instrumentation that we need for that? We need Langmuir wave, we need electron, electric field sensors, we need magnet, uh, fluxgate magnetometer sensors, and search coil magnetometer, and of course RPA. 
Now, RP I have shown uh, in, in a different color. That means retarded potential analyzer. But this I have shown in different means because these four constitute the Viper payload. And this is a separate payload onboard Viper, which is uh, on, onboard Venus orbiter, which is getting developed by PRL and IIST. So these are the, these four basically makes the Viper payload. So what we are going to measure with these basically instruments with LP the, or the Langmuir probe, we want to measure the bulk plasma parameters. That means we want to measure the electron density, the electron temperature, ion density, ion temperature, and these are the ranges what we are expecting over there around Venus. And basically, what measurements we'll be making, we'll be basically measuring the electron and ion saturation currents. Then comes the electric field sensor. What, what is the scientific aim? Basically, we want to measure the oscillating plasma wave electric field. And of course, this is electromagnetic and uh, electro for both for electrostatic waves as well as for electromagnetic waves. And these are the frequency ranges what we are expecting. And of course, we will be measuring the I1, that is the time varying electric field basically in the form of millivolt per meter. And this measurements will be, will give basically give us wave electric field at different frequencies. Then we have flux gate magnetometer with which we will be going to measure the background magnetic field. And it will be in that in the range of uh, it will be 50 to 150, but our, we have kept our range to from one to two three hundred nano tesla. And of course, these we will be measuring both VX, VY. Basically, two sets of uh, sensors will be there. So we, with each uh, uh, set, we will be measuring BX one, uh, BX, BY, BZ. The other one also be like this. And then we have a search coil magnetometer. This is the first time we are uh, when a search coil magnetometer is go, will be going to Venus. Nobody has sent it so far. And what we are go, planning to do with that? With that, we'll be measuring the oscillating plasma wave magnetic field for the electromagnetic wave only. And these are the ranges, and this is the expectation that we have. And like I said earlier, with this, we'll be measuring the wave magnetic field, which is uh, oscillating in time. Uh, so what is the unique? Sure, sure. I, I'm, I'm going to finish within four slides. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what is the uniqueness of this instrument? Basically, it is the complete instrument package, if you say, for plasma wave detection and observation after PVO. PVO uh, was sent in 19... Uh, I think uh, still 45 years have gone. I mean, till our Venus orbiter will go. So there is a huge jump in the in the, in the technology and in the scientific requirements also. And of course, uh, these types of packages are rarely sent. I, as I said, in PVO also, search coil magnetometer was not there, and only three out of these four instruments were there. And of course, uh, the Langmuir probe uh, they are improved in, 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 in to have a better measurement than what was sent on uh, PVO. And of course, search coil magnetometer is the for the first time, as I told earlier, uh, which has not been sent. So how we are going to detect plasma wave around Venus? So we know that each plasma wave basically is always designated with the with uh, is basically defined by its dispersion relation. Dispersion relation in the sense by omega, which is the angular frequency or the plasma wave frequency, and then the k, which is the wave vector over here. So if you just divide this whole equation by k square, you will get omega square by k square. And this whole thing, and then omega by k we know is nothing but the phase velocity. And if you take a differential of this d omega by uh, dk, you basically you will get the group velocity. We know what phase velocity represents, what group velocity responds. I'll not go into those details. So this basically omega we'll get directly from either from the oscillating electric field or from magnetic field for that matter. This omega p basically will will get from the density that we are going to measure with the Langmuir probe, and this weak temperature thermal velocity we are going to measure from the electron temperature. So you you can see that uh, for a small range of this variable k, this equation will get satisfied. So if we can do that, we will say that we have observed the Langmuir probe. So this 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 will be a measured quantity. This will be a measured quantity. This will be a measured quantity. And as I told, you can plot omega versus k over here. You can see over there. I'll not go into details. Running short of time. And as I told earlier. From omega by k and d omega by dk, you can find out the phase velocity and the group velocity respectively. So for each wave, whatever I, I showed earlier, uh, we, we have a dispersion relation over here. And we will find out all the parameters, the primary parameters that we are directly going to measure with the Viper instruments or the secondary that we can find out uh, from these the primary parameters, uh, we can find it out. And this is a rough sketch which I have drawn with hand where this is not uh, up to the scale, but only indicative of the direction where you can see the electron cyclotron wave will be moving in this direction. You can basically expect the electron plasma oscillations around here. You can observe, uh, expect the ion cyclotron waves over here. And this is the solar wind and the solar radiation coming towards us. And you can see the different layers, basically, the magneto sheets and uh, uh, and uh, things like that. This is the uh, south, uh, uh, that solar wind electric field in this direction. 
and you have a reconnection taking place around this place and all and this, this oblique direction basically uh, dotted lines are uh, it is the direction of the imf that is the interplanetary magnetic field so uh, with this i will finish it off and uh, if you want to know more about uh, the plasma waves as far as venus or mars are concerned there is a review paper which is uh, written by me over here and uh, i'll be happy to answer uh, any questions if they are here thank you thanks for your uh, time and attention uh, thank you pin uh, for your presentation is part of your this is schedule and uh, now uh, we have time for a quick co a couple of questions i think we can take uh, any questions in the participants from the participants in the auditorium uh, if for online participants have question you can uh, raise your hand or type your question in the chat box so i don't see any raised hands yeah I, either they have understood everything or they did not understand anything <laughs> at all <laughs> yeah looks like <laughs> yeah sorry uh, uh, you're very uh, eloquent uh, <laughs> by the way then i have a quick question uh, yeah, sure. first of all uh, excuse yeah. me for my ignorance uh, uh, so this venus doesn't have its own uh, internal magnetic field like uh, no venus cats. and mars are two two specialized planets in that sense they do not have their own uh, global magnetic field they may have small small okay. uh, anomalies uh, on the surface but a global magnetic field just like yeah. earth or other planets they do not have okay okay i was i knew about the mars but i didn't know about uh, sorry i should have mentioned that thing in the yeah. beginning but i somehow slipped that no issue ah uh, okay <laughs> yeah thank you so much yeah thank you uh, yeah still i don't see any other uh, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop sharing as yeah. for the next speaker. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And now next, let me invite uh, Navin uh, to uh, make presentation on identifying astrometric calibration in the forthcoming LMT survey. Yeah, Navin, yeah, we can see your uh, uh, presentation. Yeah, like so you, we can you hear you. Yeah, please. Okay, so I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Navin. Uh, I'm Navin Dogia and uh, I'm a JRF from Aries. I'm working with Kuntal, Dr. Kuntal Mishra, and I'll be presenting my work on identifying astrometric elevators in the forthcoming LMT survey strip. So, basically, I'll give a brief introduction about the uh, upcoming 4 meter International Liquid Mirror Telescope or LMT. So, it will be the first optical survey telescope in India, and it will feature a spinning disk filled with mercury as its primary mirror. So it will be a genital telescope, that means it will only observe uh, towards zenith and it will not track stars. And it will feature a 4K across 4K CCD imager with a FOV of 27 half minutes. And it will use STSS uh, GRI filters for observation. Uh, this CCD of it will be uh, operated in time delay integration mode, uh, the details of which I'll explain in the next slide. And uh, such survey telescope, uh, which uh, observes same strip over and over again, will be useful for transient detection and optical variability studies of stellar sources. Uh, so first of all, the shape of the mirror. So uh, basically, uh, we'll put uh, liquid mercury in a bowl and when we spin the bowl, uh, we'll get a parabolic shape mirror. So like the DZ by uh, DR uh, will be given by the centrifugal force and the gravitational uh, centrifugal acceleration and the gravitational acceleration. And from that, we can see that Z is proportional to R square. That is, we have a parabolic mirror and the focus is given by this equation. So uh, the time delay integration. In the time delay integration, what we do is basically, uh, as uh, the Earth rotates, the uh, uh, source will shift uh, from one column of pixels to the next column of pixel. So uh, we, uh, in the CCD readout, we uh, transfer that charge from one column of pixels to the next column of pixels in sync with the Earth's rotation. So uh, as the source moves, moves over the CCD, we'll get an effective exposure of 102 seconds. Uh, now, one thing before I move forward is also that uh, we need to take account uh, into the uh, precision of the LMT strip. So, uh, LMT is supposed to run for like 10 years. So, during these 10 years, due to the precision of the earth, the area of the sky that uh, LMT will uh, scan will uh, slightly change. So, uh, here uh, in the right hand side, the plot is given in J2000 coordinates. So, uh, the blue line is the uh, uh, area of sky it will uh, observe in 2021. And the uh, magenta line is the area of the sky in the observe in, uh, in 2031, so it will change slightly. So uh, to cover all of this, we have basically chosen a 54 half minute wide strip in which we'll find the astrometric elevators. So uh, uh, the strip is indicated by the dashed line. 
uh, you can see one dotted line also. So the dotted line is uh, from a previous work uh, that was done by Mandel et al. 2021. So uh, they uh, presented a Quasar catalog that was supposed to be used for the stromatic elevation of island T. But uh, from our calculation, we see that uh, this strip width is not sufficient for uh, the stromatic elevation. So I'm in motivation. So our aim is to present a catalog of objects from Gaia EDRC data because of their uh, 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 great uh, stromatic accuracy. And that will be used for the stromatic elevation of images that will be observed by the uh, island team. And uh, we cross match Gaia sources with STSS and uh, PS1 also to achieve the following goals. So first of all, uh, for estimatic purposes, it will get rid of the spurious sources and will also have the multiband photometry of resources from STSS uh, because uh, we have equivalent printers, it will be useful. Additionally, we can derive secondary products from this catalog like a photometric catalog, uh, photometric elevation catalog uh, after removing the variable sources. So that can be done as a different exercise. So I use data from three catalogs. So first of all, I use data from Gaia satellite. So it's a space-based uh, telescope by the ESA. It uh, provides accurate, uh, most accurate, probably I should say, uh, estimatic parameters, RA, deck, parallax, motions, and radial velocities of celestial objects. And uh, we have only chosen sources with parallax less than 10 milli arc second and proton motions less than 20 milli arc second, so that the sources does not move over the run time of island. And we have cross matched Gaia data with uh, Stone Digital X Sky Survey uh, data unit 17, that's the latest data release now. And uh, SDSS has been mapping the sky for many years, primarily in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it has photometry in UGRI Z bands, and it also has spectroscopic observation from around 1% uh, of the sources. Uh, uh, as actually, SDSS does not cover the sky homogeneously. So, for some area of the sky that does not cover, like in our region of interest, uh, we have also uh, cross matched Gaia with uh, Penn Stars. Which, uh, so, Penn Star has uh, surveyed 3 5 star radiant sky and uh, it also uses the DRI Z5 filters and we use this catalog wherever SDS does not cover the sky. So, I'll uh, go over the cross matching procedure now. So, first of all, let's, uh, this is the example of a typical field. So, A is the star we are uh, trying to cross match. Uh, so, first of all, we select all the stars all the sources uh, that are in a rectangle of uh, half width 2.4 uh, arc seconds. So uh, that will be like the star one and two. Then uh, we propagate position and the covariance matrix. That's the position and like array deck and the errors associated with it of the Gaia source to the epochs of the each source. So whatever sources we find in this 2.4 uh, arc second uh, uh, wide uh, rectangle, we basically uh, to, to see when they were observed and we move the, uh, we use the proper motion available in Gaia to move the uh, position of A to some uh, other uh, position in uh, A prime. Uh, and the errors are also increased slightly a bit because of the uh, errors in that proper motion. Now we calculate the angular distance between the new position of the Gaia source and secondary catalog sources. So if we have at least one source that's closer than two arc second, uh, then, and it also fill, uh, fulfills the good neighbor criteria that I have explained in the next slide. Then we said that uh, it is a cross match. So, here uh, one would be cross match of the A, uh, a star. A. After all the cross matching, we have applied to additional filters. So, we have only kept sources that has I band magnitude between 16.5 and 22 that are the bright and faint limit of the island respectively. And we have also removed dry sources that were cross match to the same secondary catalog source. Because Gaia is angular at higher resolution, uh, we uh, believe like uh, these might be binary sources that were resolved in Gaia but not in SDSS. So these might throw the astrometric uh, elevation off. Now the good neighbor criteria. So this is basically a probabilistic uh, cross match uh, criteria. So uh, errors in astrometric uh, catalogs are uh, basically uh, represented by error ellipse. So you can see the red and uh, the blue error ellipse. And uh, we can also define it as a covariance matrix. So, but the covariance matrix needs to be defined as a frame, and it's typically given in the uh, northeast frame, that is the RA deck frame. So, we uh, in uh, the right hand side, you can see that uh, error in RA, error in deck are given for all the catalogs. And uh, in Gaia, uh, this alpha uh, correlation term is also given, so we use that. Uh, so, first of all, what we need to do is like uh, the green, uh, green rectangle you see, these are the northeast frame or like RA deck frame. First of all, we need to move it in a new frame. Uh, that passes through both the sources. So that's the XY frame. So we apply rotation matrix, uh, matrix to both the sources. So we get this rec, uh, red and the blue rectangle. 
and after that, uh, since uh, errors in uh, both these sources, both these catalogs are independent of each other, uh, the convolution of these error products basically is the sum of these error products. Uh, and uh, this, uh, so uh, the second catalog object is a cross match of first catalog object, like a good neighbor of uh, first catalog object, if it satisfies this condition, uh, which uses the convolution, uh, convoluted error uh, um, parameters. So here, uh, here k gamma is the mahalan of this distance, and its value for a 99.7% confidence level uh, would be 3.439. So we have only chosen sources that satisfy this condition. Uh, now, after cross matching uh, with SDSS, we found cross matches for around uh, 0 0.8 million bias sources. And uh, in the left hand side, uh, the RA histogram is given. And as you can see, like uh, some uh, in some RA things, there are no sources. Uh, the, that's because SDSS does not uh, have any coverage in these areas. And in the right hand side, uh, you can see the angular separation flow. So these are basically uh, a histogram of angular separation between the uh, Gaia source and the, its counterpart. So as you can see, most, uh, most of the sources are cross matched within a very less distance, that's 0 0.2 arc second. So these are probably like uh, a very high probability that these are the actual counterparts of the Gaia source. And again, uh, like when S where SDS is not covering the sky, we have uh, filled the gap with cross matching with pen stars. And uh, this is mostly in the galactic latitude regions. And also, like the uh, sources are uh, matched very closely there also. And we found uh, cross match for around 3 million bias sources in pen star one. Uh, so, this is the final catalog. So, uh, initially, we started with 7.6 million bias sources. Uh, so, uh, this uh, exercise was also computationally heavy. And uh, basically, uh, I uh, wrote most of the things uh, in Python itself. Uh, we were not like too focused on. Uh, on the performance is like it needs to be done only once. So um, we I just used uh, Python, and uh, then uh, for after some initial printing, uh, we had 5.4 million bias sources, and uh, after uh, the cross match with SDSS, we found 8.8 uh, 886,000 sources in SDSS, and uh, 3 uh, million sources in PS1, and in the sources from SDSS, like. Uh, a spectroscopic observation of for 11360 objects were also available, and that can be used for some other uh, secondary products like a quasar catalog, maybe like a, a galaxy or Asian variability study or something like that. So, finally, we I have been not 10 minutes or over. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, we finally uh, have uh, 3.5 million sources that have magnitude between 16.5 and 22 uh, uh, mag, and uh, we hope that uh, this will be used for astronomical calibration. In the right hand side, you can see the uh, island is stripped in the galactic coordinates. So, in RA uh, deck coordinates, it will be a straight line, but in galactic coordinates, it will pass through the galactic pole and uh, uh, the shape is like this. And uh, there are some high density regions near the galactic equator as expected. Uh, so, the final catalog, so as of now, the final catalog is stored in uh, two SQLite databases. And uh, the databases contains like uh, multiple tables. One is the close match table that only contains the basic data like uh, Gaia ID, catalog ID, and the regular separation, RA and DEC. And uh, this would be sufficient for the automatic generation. And if we need the photometric information as well, there are additional tables like Gaia, which contains all the Gaia, uh, Gaia data, and SDSS or Penstar, which contain the photometry from these catalogs. And also we have SDSS spec table uh, that has the spectro spectroscopic information from all the uh, uh, available sources. So the way we access is it by uh, using uh, simple SQLite queries. So here you can see like uh, we are uh, pulling data between RA20 and 40 uh, and uh, we are uh, also uh, pulling out the photometric information available. Uh, so as I said, like around for around 11,000 sources, we also uh, have, have the spectroscopic uh, data. So uh, in the left hand side, there's a plot of uh, the classification. So SDSS uh, have uh, for the sources that have spectroscopic observation. It uh, classifies them as star, or galaxy. So that's shown here. There are gaps in the data because SDSS does not cover the sky. And on the right hand side, there's a red circle. Uh, so I'll quickly summarize. Uh, so we'll ha we have generated a catalog of objects from Gaia that will be used to perform astrometric calibration of images that will be observed by the upcoming island research. And uh, this catalog is this uh, this catalog lists the precise astrometry from Gaia and the photometry from SDSS or PS1, 
and this has been achieved by close matching Gaia with these two catalogs. And the final catalog contains around 3.5 million sources that have index less than 10 milli second and proper motion less than 20 milli second, so they are ideal asymmetric elevators. And this data is stored in SQL databases for easy access, and this will be infused in that uh, LMT data handling pipeline. Uh, basically, as I told, like uh, the money I told uh, work, uh, I, we have also uh, recreated the work with uh, a bigger strip uh, that I was not sure. Uh, also, uh, that's a closer catalog. And uh, this work is still in progress, and in the future, a photometric calibrate, uh, calibration catalog can also be generated using only non variable sources from uh, this catalog itself. So, a catalog of spectroscopically confirmed white drops is only uh, already been generated. So, we took all the uh, spectroscopic observation and uh, we look for sources that have been confirmed as white drops. So, we, uh, that's a separate evidence. Thank you. Um, thank you, Navin, for finishing your talking time. Uh, time for questions. Uh, if there are any questions uh, from the participants in the auditorium, I can go ahead and ask. Yeah, uh, one second. Uh, is this it likely to be operational? Uh, LMT is supposed like uh, this April, uh, April or May, like this summer, we are uh, planning to uh, like have the operational. Uh, Basically, due to the pandemic, this has been like we getting delayed and delayed. Uh, so, like uh, the people from Belgium uh, who are uh, the collaborators in this project are also supposed to come in April or May. And this will also be in Brazil. Yeah, this is also this is all this. Hello, hello, Yeah, I have a nice question. So, yeah. in this uh, spinning mirror uh, mm -hmm. concept, right? Yeah. Uh, so, does the way you are you saying that the way you have your catalog uh, and the pipeline set up mm -hmm. is that you, does the accuracy at which you are able to focus, given the way this liquid is spinning yeah. and the way that finely focus is at a point, does okay. that yeah. affect your calibration or your catalog, the way the position accuracy, and so on? No, actually, the final images will most likely be seeing limited. Yeah, so like diffraction limited uh, is uh, like uh, the effects from the liquid mercury. Like, there are waves, uh, like, uh, it's uh, possible that there are like some waves and stuff, like, this has been demonstrated. But uh, we are covering the mercury after it forms a mirror, we are covering it with a mylar film. film. So, only uh, wind turbulence and stuff like that is like, uh, uh, like, less. Uh, so that's why, like uh, the focus images will start. It's uh, actually been tested. Like uh, some liquid mirror concept is. Yeah. So uh, really nice talk. One question I had was in your Gaia selection ca uh, yeah. criteria, you did not have any. Uh, you did not remove uh, astrometric uh, binaries or anything. Do you, do you actually consider those? Because yeah. So basically, like uh, I completely skipped over. So basically, we have this filter also. This is. Astrometric excess noise significance. Oh. Yeah, so we are actually doing sure. whatever, like uh, at bad astrometric error, we are doing that. Yeah, I think we have all the questions from uh, here. Uh, is there any questions? Okay, excellent. Uh, then there's one question online from Mugundan. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just had this uh, question that given that you have a four meter aperture, is there a plan uh, for like? Uh, Doing adapt to optics on the secondary mirror or something to like get uh, to diffraction limited. Sorry, uh, like, some other plans. Uh, like, can you repeat your question? I, think I, can... no, I was wondering, like, uh, since you have a four uh, meter aperture, yeah. is, there, is there a plan to like uh, do some kind of um, image correction to reach the diffraction limited resolution? Like, maybe some di uh, adapt to optics on the secondary yeah. side. Uh, so, there are, I think, uh, five piece correction uh, like element between the primary and secondary mirror. Okay. So that uh, uh, corrects the like uh, hyperbolic like uh, effects also. And, uh, okay. 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 Thank you. One other one other question that I had was uh, like also when you are processing the image from the CCD, do you directly uh, get like like a normal telescope? Do you directly get a proper photograph of the field, or do you also have to do some corrections to? Because I think the liquid uh, mirror, the mirror, the the liquid which is making the mirror's primary is going to be rotating. Uh, at a certain speed. So, do you have to correct for those motions of the primary mirror and everything? Uh, 
Yeah, no, actually, like the, at the end, the uh, mirror is formed, and it's like uh, there might be some wind disturbance. But as I said, like we cover it with a like very thin layer of mylar film, so like there are not any disturbances. And uh, like the PSF shape is uh, basically the uh, difference will be like it will have a different uh, different type of PSF than like a traditional telescope. So like uh, there's basically a very uh, sharp uh, feature on top of a broad feature. That's the shape of its PSF. Uh, but other than that, like there will be no uh, like uh, directions needed. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? Okay, looks like there's no other question online. And uh, thank you, Naveen, again. And uh, yeah, this with this we come to the end of this uh, session. And thank you all. Thanks all the speakers and also the participants online as well as in person uh, participants. Thank you so much. I, I guess uh, the um, next session should start uh, yes. for uh, four ten. <laughs> yes.